Hello, my name Hi. is Matt Kelly. On today's program, we'll be speaking about the future of education. For a number of weeks now, I've been wanting to speak with a homeschool advocate here in the state of Vermont because I believe that this is the future of education. And this has been brought home this past week with yet another tragic school shooting. Over 20 dead, most of them young children in the fourth grade. I'm pleased to be joined today by Retta Dunlap. She is with the Vermont Home Education Network, vhen.org. It is a nonprofit advocacy organization that's dedicated to promoting and enhancing home education in Vermont. Retta, thank you for joining me here today. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, even on a local scale, school violence is in the news just today on Champlain Valley Union's campus, police are on site due to a potential threat, and police have just recently seized weapons following a Montpelier school threat. The threat is real. The emotional dysregulation of our students, school shootings, school bullying, COVID-19, which has shut down many schools and forced children to learn at home, uh, families who weren't prepared for this, as well as the crumbling infrastructure, the deferred maintenance of many of our schools uh, nationwide, particularly those inner city schools that are crumbling and are unsafe for students to be educated in. And the disagreeable curriculum that many may find objectionable with the recent rise of CRT and teaching sexuality and education, sexuality education in schools. So Retta, there's a lot here for us to try to wrap ourselves around. And before we get into that, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience uh, and take a minute to, to share a, a little bit about your background and how you came to homeschooling. Um, well, I'm one of those people that intentionally chose homeschooling some you know 40 odd years ago uh my oldest is well he's oldest he's 39 so i i had, to, I had decided to, to homeschool before they were born uh, before they were conceived i was going to homeschool because it just was a natural progression for me to to, to organically you know raise vegetables you, you organically raise children and why all of a sudden when they hit the age of they need to learn to read do i suddenly need an expert to help me do that and I don't. Um, so I chose it on purpose and homeschooling, educating them just became part of life. It was a lifestyle for us, not just school, but a lifestyle. And you know, today I'm seeing parents choose homeschooling as a second choice. Um, I, I, for the most part, maybe I'm a dying breed where we, we, we chose to do it on purpose. It was just all part of everything um but the, the reasons people homeschool by and large are different now some of the things that you mentioned are reasons for some you know there, there are different reasons i know that you know um not not on the level of seriousness of some of the things you met but a lot of parents will homeschool because of a special needs issue that their child is is not it's not being met by the iep which they spend a couple thousand dollars to create the iep and then they don't have the staff or the effort or the resources to actually you know, apply that IEP to the child. I, I am stunned that, you know, over the years, because I work with parents, somehow public schooling parents find me and want to ask about homeschooling. I mean, my phone number is out there, my email is out there, but not too many, but, but they do find me. And I'm like, well, I've never been in a public school. Um, I did make a, a part of me to, uh, to learn how the public school works so that when parents need to work within it, I say, you start with the teacher, the principal, the superintendent, then the school board. You don't just start with the school board because they are not the day-to-day -day operations. Anyway, so that's kind of why home, I chose the homeschool. I have four children. Uh, the youngest is 32, the other one is 39. Um, and uh, I you know, have a grandbaby now that's going, you know, mom's gonna homeschool her, uh, mom and dad, and and when when my youngest turned seven they changed the law and i didn't know they did it 
they it wasn't the homeschooling law it was the compulsory attendance age went from six from seven to six which meant i had to enroll my youngest a year earlier and i was irritated because i was informed of this in july and i had already sent in my enrollments for the other three i would add danielle the following year and i said never again are you going to fool me, you know, surprise me. I'm just, I'm, so I have been watching that legislature and that statute, it's in Title 16, the Education Statute 166B, Home Study it's called, um, because it's disruption when, when you change something and parents don't know. So now over the years, we've been able to stop bad things from happening because we're paying attention now. And so it's important to know, particularly for parents who may be watching here, is that if you are considering homeschooling uh, your student, there is actually a whole support network mm -hmm. to help you along the way. So you're not going into this blindly. And in fact, the state sort of has a curriculum that they mandate certain uh, parameters to this. So it's not a fly by night, anti uh, no. anything organization. It's really here to help serve parents who may want to make this education decision as opposed to the public school education. And so can you talk a little bit about the state framework and how VHEN has helped to uh, create it and strengthen it? Um, well, the, you're talking about the framework of homeschoolers. Yes, but again, yeah, it, there's a statewide yeah. program that VHEN and the people who decide to homeschool literally have to follow. So this is, in yeah. essence, it is a statewide uh, understanding, but you also feel that the state is perhaps falling short. So talk again about what the okay. state yeah. requires and what VHEN is helping to uh, create and grow and strengthen. Okay, so the home study statute, uh, the, well, the compulsory attendance statute says that every child shall be enrolled in a public and independent or a home study program. And there's some other special cases where a child might be educated outside of the public school building, but um, you know, say the child can't go to school, they have leukemia, so that school is working with the parents to get the child an education home. That That is something, but that's within the public school system. Um, and the law says that uh, we are to follow the minimum course of study in the statute, which is 906. The schools follow it too, but they have a bunch of rules, regulations, and documents piled on top of that little tiny minimum course of study, which is only eight bullet, it's six bullet points, two of them have two parts. Um, and, and they're the subjects you would think math, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, uh, history, science, fine arts, physical education, maybe something else I missed. Literature, I think, is. And um, parents write their own course of study. The parents decide what they're going to study and when they're going to study it. And the home study statute is supposed to be simply a notification by the parent telling the state, my child will be in homeschooling this year, it will be in home study, they will not be enrolling in the public school system. And I'm giving you some paperwork, here's what we're gonna cover. If I've been doing it for years, I might need to get an assessment, you know, um, just so I can document that the child is progressing, because we don't have to say, your child is in third grade, they need to be in third grade level. That's not how the statute works. It's, it's to the age and ability of each child. And uh, parents, I tell them you're not seeking permission, you're not asking for approval. Um, this is your choice because the statute is set up that once you submit that paperwork, that date they receive it, they have 45 days to stop you from homeschooling or you're automatically enrolled. Now the state can within three days turn a letter right around and say you're enrolled immediately. That's their choice, but they have 45 days to stop it. So if you submit form A, your that clock starts ticking and to stop you they have to call a hearing to stop the enrollment from happening and i don't think they like that but it's rarely used and when it's used it's you know i mean it's um i mean this whole paperwork process that homeschooling parents submit to the state doesn't catch bad characters that's it's just busy work and um, so vhen uh, what is the role in trying to strengthen this community and grow it and make sure that those 
students who go through this process are uh, fully educated to a standard that they're able to go out into society and, and, and be independent? Well, um, first off, how the child is educated and, and how prepared they are to go into the society is totally up to the parent. Sure. Um, there, there's no organization in Vermont that, that can, even, you know, the state can't even do that. So what VHEN does and primarily um, primarily does is it watches the statute to make sure it's not changed. It, it tries to work with the Department of uh, Agency now of Education, trying to get them to stay within the parameters of the statute because the statute is laid out in such a way that it is to control what the Agency of Education does with this process of enrolling in home study. It's not meant to be there to control the parent and you know, you need three more things. We need four more words in history. You know, we need a book list, uh, you know, things like that. Um, so the, I, I, I want to be kind because, you know, the Agency of Education has so many laws and policies and rules to follow that they, they can't keep up with them. The, the reporting on financials and, and grades and everything is so overwhelming. They're always a year or two behind mm -hmm. at least. And so they don't need any more work. They work hard, yet there's four or five staff members. There's only about 200 of them total in the agency of ed, but there's four or five of them that work on home study on this paperwork that doesn't improve education. It, 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 it doesn't catch bad actors. It does none of those things. The thing the state needs to know and this is where home, where VHEN is coming in is, you know, I'm, I've been talking with the Secretary of Education. What do, what do they need to know and what do they need need submitted? And basically, they, this agency of education, but not so much them, but the school system, the local, the local truancy officers, the local superintendents, the local principals, they need to know that this child is enrolled in home study, is being homeschooled. This is the parent's name, the child's name, the child's age. This is the address where they live. They are in our district and we know where they are is what the, what the state needs to know because you don't, you don't want you know, them to crawl under a rock and disappear. Right. But, I mean, there are, and there are people who think that they shouldn't even know that much and, and that's fine. Behan doesn't argue either way on that one. That, again, it's, up, it's a parental choice thing. Yeah. to really decide how you want to do this. But VHEN is primarily the advocacy arm of, of homeschooling in Vermont um, because- at, it, a, at the state level, basically. At the, at the state level, okay. because if they bring up the statute, I soon show up um, okay. and people let me know and I try to keep an eye on it. And I could miss something, I'm not perfect, but that's what VHEN does. Now we do operate with, there's a lot of Facebook pages. There's a couple of them that are quite large, have two or three, 2,000, you know, uh, members on at least one of the Facebook pages that I work with primarily. And that's how homeschoolers network is through those Facebook pages, through emails, mm -hmm. um, not, not so much through VHEN, because I've just never really developed those pieces. Right. It's just somebody had to have boots on the ground in Montpelier or we would have lost lots of things all the, already. So that's a neural network is what I call it. I, there's nodes I plug into when yeah. things come up. We're speaking with Retta Dunlop from VHEN.org, the Vermont Home Education Network. Uh, Retta, what resources then are available to the parents who want to make the homeschool choice? What, what teaching aids um, are there to help uh, a, a parent try to make this decision in terms of uh, on subjects perhaps that they're not uh, well versed on. I mean, I, I couldn't even do algebra today. So if I made that decision and wanted to educate uh, home homeschool my child, what what uh, what resources are there available for me to help teach and educate my my child? Um, I mean, you can find a tutor. You can find good materials. You can search on Google on how to homeschool and join one of these Facebook pages. Ask or, or just email the, the admin and, and start asking questions or email me, you can give my email address. And you just start asking questions because we live in a society now where almost everyone knows someone who homeschooled or they know someone who knows someone and they can go and find them. And, and believe me, homeschooling parents will be happy to talk to you. So I think the biggest resource about how to get started going homeschooling is to talk to a homeschooler. 
the local libraries. We all, the, the homeschoolers all tend to plug into the libraries. Go to the librarian and ask, is there a homeschool group here? You know, try two or three different libraries if, if you don't find, you know, one doesn't know. So that's one way you can plug into people who homeschool and start asking questions. Uh, Google is out there. You can also, you know, Google. As far as the resources to help you educate your child, um, like I said, it's organic. If you taught them to use a fork and tie their shoe, you can educate them. When you get into the high school years and you're, you're not real sure about math, there are video math programs. Math tutors you can find and hire. There are online courses for homeschoolers. Khan Academy is out there and it's free. Um, there are some other um, online programs that you can uh, you can purchase it and it'll do all five courses or whatever you're doing. Um, but as far as, you know, certifying people to do this, no, as it, you know, it, it, it's, again, you're a parent and you teach your children 24 seven, you just don't realize it. Yeah, and I think that's an important uh, thing to mention here is that, you know, does education stop when school is out? Of course not. Your children are continually learning throughout summer uh, and the like. And what's rather interesting is I talk to uh, members of the public about homeschooling. One thing that continually comes up is, well, what about the socialization of children? And I, I, I just shake my head. I'm like, uh, particularly in today's soccer mom uh, mentality, children are scheduled uh, uh, relentlessly for interactions uh, uh, and socialization opportunities with other children throughout their uh, communities uh, absent uh, uh, public school. Um, yeah, I mean, socialization is, is no big deal in homeschooling because parents are very good at finding support groups. They find meet, you know, meet uh, um, play groups or they find groups they do uh, field trips with or or you know, th th things like that. But as far as the socialization question, and, and I'll give you the, the one, one comment that comes up is going, I'd send them to school to socialize them how, what are they going to do? Are they going to learn bullying? Are they going to be bullied? So what kind of socialization skills or activities are in the schools or are in, you know, so socialization happens wherever it happens and it doesn't have to be all eight-year-olds it can be generations moving together um old young and, and that's what i found with my kids they could communicate with someone who was 80 as well as sit on my oldest son there when he was an adult he could get on the floor and play legos with a little kid and i'm watching that going wow you know i my generation you know i went to public schools we didn't do that we stuck mm. within our within our cohort and and uh and so, you know, socialization, you have to ask the question, what kind of socialization are you talking about? And, and is, is a, and I don't even want to use the public schools, is an institutionalized setting always the best for a socialization activity to occur in? Sometimes it's not. And, and so, you know, kids need to learn to deal with all kinds of situations and homeschool, I mean, socialization is just not a problem, but it's always thrown out there. Here in the state of Vermont, uh, we spend almost twenty thousand dollars per student per year in the public education system. Do homeschoolers get that type of financial support? And if not, why not? And should they? Well, no, they don't get that support at all. And as I tell homeschooling parents, you know, who who would like. Uh, a voucher, well, vouchers are different, who would like a chunk of money to maybe buy materials and stuff. I said, you know, with money comes strings. So I, I am not in favor of the state giving money directly to homeschooling parents. Hmm. That said, I'm not opposed to them getting a voucher um, or, well, or, maybe or a, a tax, right. excuse me, a tax credit would be a right. better idea. Because and that seems to sort of be the thing right now where you can get up to a $20,000 tax credit that then you could use to hire a tutor in certain subjects. Is that correct? Yeah, or that's yeah, what I mean, the national uh, yes, that is, that, is. That, that is what a tax credit, that means it's off of your taxes. So assuming that you know, your family income would be large enough to, to do something like that. And, you know, I mean, if the state were to say we're going to $500 for materials, you know, would I lobby against it? 
I would go in and say my piece and then I would inform homeschoolers this is going on and they would go in and say their piece and and my goal would be as an advocate in that situation if the legislators and the families were all for that I'd be going just don't tie it to 166 B because I don't want it to become if you don't do what we say in 166 B you don't you know you took the money it's the string now so I want that statute to remain pure clean clear free of of any kind of monetary influence so um uh, and as for as for how much I mean yeah I had four kids in school we could have gone to Europe for history every year no well, that's, that's something the legislature and taxpayers want funded I yeah it's a big question um and, and, and that right there is sort of the issue for me as I look at the future of education and what we see now again with school shootings, school bullying. We've got another major pandemic coming within five years. If you listen to Bill Gates and believe what he says, crumbling infrastructure, deferred maintenance, $20,000 a year per pupil. If you have for example, two kids in the age of the public school system, that's near $40,000, enough to have one parent stay home and be the primary educator. If, if this money were given directly to the parent rather than as a grant, and then they could decide to you know, uh, go and hire a tutor. And so this yes. then goes back into you know, teacher salaries and whatnot, you know, We'll use Burlington High School as an example. There's 965 students in there currently and uh, not even 200 educators in, in that uh, uh, structure. And again, if you had that money directly and we got rid of the public school system, those 200 educators could be the tutors that then you hire to educate mm -hmm. your children. And I say this given the fact that a recent uh, survey came out of teachers here in Vermont and nationwide, and the majority of teachers said they do not feel safe in their own classrooms, due in part to the increasing emotional dysregulation of our nation's youth. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's frightening what's going on with the children now. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll step out of my wheelhouse and and I'll, I'll go to an issue you haven't mentioned and but the one I think of when we, we talk about these 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 conversations of what's what's happening to the kids what's making them angry enough to do the things they're doing when they become adults or almost adults and um, the you know this country is one of the highest consumers of child trafficking stuff okay and and, and the, nobody talks about it now, you know, when children are abused, they they don't they don't um, they don't uh, they don't the way they think affects how they grow up, and and so now you have damaged people and more damaged people and more and more damaged people, and then you just go down just take that down a bit and you go down the line. Bullying in the schools can do the same thing to a child. Right. So so we've got a lot of things going on with the youth of the country that we don't address, and and that that puts pressure on homeschooling. So one of my other functions at VHEN is to try and you know, take a look at these pressures. I mean, in COVID, okay, one year, homeschool, the number homeschooling numbers doubled. It went from- I was gonna ask that. It went from 2,300 to about 4,500 that very first year. And it's, it's still up there. You know, the, a lot of these parents didn't go back to the schools. I mean, I was listening to the radio when Governor Scott said, we're going to close the schools. This is on a Friday, now they closed on Wednesday. And I'm going, oh, you should not do that. Because I have been told in multiple committee meeting hearings and one-on-one and -on -one meetings with staff from the agency for decades, for decades that the public school is the, sometimes the safest place for some of these children. And, and that and this is why, yeah, but this is why we need the paperwork from you, Retta, that, that we're, we're, we just wanna make sure that your kids stay safe too. And I'm like going, you have a, you have a crack in the public school system, you could lose a semi through and that, that didn't go over well. Um, so so we're, we're talking about, you know, just what is going on and, and I'm some of these kids during COVID who didn't go to school were now locked in a room, possibly with someone who shouldn't have been locked in a room with them. And I'm I just shake my head. Don't tell me I have to give you paperwork because it's obvious you don't need it. Um, but, um, uh, what's important to note here too is that you know 
if kids were at risk through home uh, living instead of going to school, I, I counter that with the same question that, well, well, schools are failing children as well. Children are graduating and they certainly don't know the ABCs and basic arithmetic and uh, reading and writing. So it's, it's a juxtaposition. And my belief here is that if we are serious about uh, combating and deconstructing the elements of structural racism, the public school system is one of the root causes of it. And all you have to look at, again, is inner city schools that are failing due to crumbling infrastructure or poor teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than putting it on a system that is inherently uh, structurally racist, put that onus back onto the parents so that we have uh, responsible parenting. And I understand that, you know, schools today are much more than just an education. It's about health care through the school nurse. It's about uh, food uh, through the uh, school lunch program, et cetera, et cetera. But again, if this money were given directly to the parent, it has the opportunity, in my belief, to end structural racism, to lift the country's youth out of childhood poverty and to give us uh, highly educated children. And I say that based on my own experience. Going through the Burlington school system in the early 70s, my parents were aghast at what we were not learning. So I had to learn my multiplication tables around the dinner table. I had to learn the 50 states and their capitals around the dinner table. And interestingly enough, my twin brother in third grade uh, got a demerit for uh, being asked what the capital of Kentucky was. And he said Frankfurt. And the teacher was like, no, it's Lexington. And he had to go to a dictionary or to a, an encyclopedia and pointed out to his third grade teacher. My, my twin was smarter than his third grade teacher. And I learned the uh, Scandinavian countries and their capitals, and even my contemporaries today probably couldn't answer that. And so my twin brother, he educated his children at home. They are some of the most well-behaved, very intelligent children. A friend of mine in Madison, Wisconsin, which seems to have a much stronger home uh, education homeschooling uh, advocacy organization, no, no disrespect to you, but it's a larger population, so it's much stronger. Uh, his children, his 12-year-old, uh, created a walking app for his city. His oldest is uh, getting his uh, doctorate. Uh, so, you know, the belief that maybe homeschooling isn't enough, I think, is a fallacy, and, and we have the proof uh, to show for it. Right. I mean, as I've always said, and even in my own homeschool group, while we're, we were um, educating our children and the mothers would sit down and eventually you know, have an hour to talk without, you know, too many children around and usually playing somewhere. Um, we would we would get a chuckle out of a homeschooling magazine. I think one time was a, mo a mom on the cover. She was stirring a pot of spaghetti with a book in her hand reading. And we're going, like, do people like that really exist? Because I don't have time to stir the pot and read. You know? right. um, so homeschooling families are of all sizes and shapes and any kind of combination of whatever labels you want to slap on them. Because um, you're going to have homeschooling families who struggle. Their children struggle educationally. They, they may miss some pieces. They may not get what they need. They may go back into the public schools. I mean, Homeschooling isn't perfect. It does not. It, it doesn't educate children all to the level of, you know, PhDs and stuff. I mean, my own children. I mean, my sons now in a software business, and I work part time for them. And and uh, and um, yeah, they were little hoodlums, you know. <laughs> it's like um, I began to wonder if they were ever going to like, you know, um, um, mount to mention. And one of them, I swear, I never saw him read a book, but I know he has because his history is knowledge is amazing mm -hmm. um so so yeah homeschooling isn't perfect so i don't like people to to glorify it and put it up on a pedestal 
because then that makes advocacy for it hard because there are sometimes families who should not homeschool who are homeschooling. That does occur. But by and large, that's not the case because these families, they, they, they're, it's their second choice, but they're, but they're pulling them and they're homeschooling them. Therefore, they will come up with what they need to get it done. They will find someone. And you know the public schools are not perfect, but in my advocacy, I try not to bash them too much because I never was in them, and now I, you know, I, I've tried to understand them, served on boards and committees and stuff about public education, and um, you know, yeah, it's not perfect, and I know there's a lot of things going on in the schools now that that are, to you know, could be frightening to many families, but you know, it's it's part of the advocacy thing. I'm not gonna go in and, you know, advocate to have them closed or anything like that. So I don't want people to think that, I, that I'm, you know, I mean, all this, a lot of those issues that you mentioned in the schools, I mean, I don't, I don't advocate on them one way or the other when I end up in Montpelier at the State House. It, it, I'm it, very it, focused on one thing. Right. It seems that a parent's commitment and involvement in their child's education really is the ingredient to success. And I, again, I use that where my parents were then very active yeah, in making sure I learned rather than parents today who just say, oh, we're going to leave it up to somebody else, some public institution, and we just pray. Uh, but like you say, I mean, the education doesn't stop after 3.40 p.m. or 2.40 p.m. No. during the school year or uh, during summer. Well, I, and I can give you some real world information on that particular point there. Last summer, I was appointed by the governor to the after school study task force. And they were looking, I get my facts right, I think there was a model in Finland of them starting after school programs. And, and so, you know, being the person I am, I went right to the primary source and I, I read what they did. I read, because in, in their study, they determined that the one thing that helped in an after school program, the difference between kids succeeding and not succeeding, okay, the component in, in that success was the parent. Wow. So they decided that they might, okay, we're going to give the parents a stipend so you can go do some field trips with your children or other things like that, or get parents involved in community sports or having, you know, so they were trying to pull in the parents in the after school program as like the number one thing to make, help these children be even more successful and then to help those who, who were struggling. And of course, when it gets to applied to a Vermont, I would kept saying, well, where's the parent component? But, mm. you know, I, I suspect Vermont, just like we have, um, um, I don't know, universal pre-K, we're going to have universal after school programs eventually run in the schools, through the schools. I mean, my local town has has a has a program, which I encouraged and, and I did volunteer once or twice to, to be at um, because you can't have kids after school running around with no oversight on school property. Um, either the, the parents need to pick them up or they need to be in a, some kind of program or a, in, in a setting where it has adult eyes on them. Um, so yeah, I, I just found that stunning that that Finland saw that the parent was the key and they shoveled some money over to the parent to try and solve what problems. And I think they were looking at middle and high school kids, mm -hmm. not not elementary kids. They, and that's again they why keep I them out of, they were trying to keep them out of trouble because that unsupervised time right. between school and dinner is very dangerous time for kids because they can get into a lot of trouble. And that's what Finland was trying to stop because parents you know, might be still working or, or whatever the case may be. So that's a real world conversation that was had in Vermont last summer because I brought it up. Hey, what about this parent piece? And that's the piece I think our modern educational system is, it, we keep pushing that that part away. Yeah. And at the risk of bringing up parental rights, um, you know, who, who manages the child's upbringing and education and the rights which they were born with, okay, and, 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 they and, and a newborn cannot exercise anything. They're busy breathing and eating and growing. Um, so who who is the one who's supposed to take care of that? Who's the one who's supposed to guide them through learning what their rights are and how to exercise them in a in a proper way in a societal affirming way? And that that person is and should be the parent first. Uh, Retta, we're running out of time. So briefly, just give us a wrap up about vhen.org, the Vermont. 
Home Education Network, your advocacy and uh, the future of homeschooling here in the state of Vermont. I think the future of homeschooling in Vermont looks bright. Um, it, it's, it's going strong. Uh, VHEN is going to continue to be that voice between the parent and the state. Um, when you're in a public school, you have a whole school system between you and the state. So public school parents don't deal with legislators, laws, and agency of education staff. Homeschoolers do. And they're busy educating, so I kind of fill that void. VHEN fills that void between the parent and the state is how I word it. Um, that's 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 the land I stand on and uh, one thing that's amazing about homeschooling in Vermont that I've noticed over the years is all kinds of people homeschool right left uh, any color education style religious or non-religious and I'm talking you know even to a Wiccan homeschooling group in southern Vermont for several years um, Muslim, Jew, Christian, Hindu, uh, they, they all do. They all homeschool, atheists homeschool, and, and often th their religion is not the driving factor as to why they homeschool, but that they have different religious views, different political views. And I know on, on, on some of my, uh, my um, I had some Yahoo groups and some of the Facebooks uh, that I'm involved in, especially the one that I'm mostly related to, Discussion of these other topics is not allowed. We don't talk about God. We don't talk about religion. We don't talk about the election on these boards because the second you go there, the second you go there, the 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 homeschooling group it fractures. And so when I go to the state house, I want you know many voices, but one voice. And when you stay on one topic, and that is the right to homeschool your child and determine their 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 educational um, uh, career. We all agree. It's and where, wonderful. And where can parents get more information and contact you, Retta? All right. So they can go to uh, www.vhen.org. Um, it, it's got some information on it, some old. I, I just always have time to, to do anything with it. And my email is mountainfold. That's M O U N T A I N F O L D B T at gmail.com. Um, it's my personal email and people can email me and, and just let me know, you know what you need. We've been speaking with Retta Dunlap. She is uh, with vhen.org, the Vermont Home Education Network, a nonprofit advocacy organization that works to uh, strengthen and enhance home education of uh, school age children here in Vermont. Retta, thank you so much for your time. And we thank you, uh, the viewer, for watching. And we encourage you to uh, explore this topic more if it's something that is of interest to you by again visiting vhen.org. For Town Meeting Television, I'm Matt Kelly. Thank you for watching.